Sir, I click on it. Wait a minute. I will check. Yeah, it's starting now. This meeting is being live streamed. But it is not appearing on the YouTube actually. Okay, now it started. Professor Jani, you can take over. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, hello. Uh, welcome, everyone. It's a great pleasure to introduce uh, today's speaker, Professor Ian Venkatramana, uh, a longtime colleague uh, at uh, my, uh, I, my a long time colleague of mine at the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. He joined TIFR in 1979 uh, after right after his BSc. Actually, uh, MSc was the norm, but he was one of the people who was admitted uh, right after BSc. And uh, after that, uh, it has been a great pleasure to see him uh, you know, uh, progress uh, continuously, uh, step by step. And uh, uh, he's now uh, a senior professor at the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, continues to be senior professor at the uh, Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. The meanwhile, of course, is a uh, much traveled person. He has been to uh, many, uh, he has visited many institutions, will not go into too many details here. And uh, <coughs> yeah, uh, among uh, the, his uh, uh, awards and recognitions, I uh, should like to mention uh, the uh, Shanti Swarup Bhatnagar Award, one of the standard awards, uh, I mean, one of the coveted awards in, in, in India. Then you, you also have, was a recipient of the J.C. Bose Fellowship. Uh, he's also a fellow of the Indian Academy of Sciences from Bangalore and uh, also the Indian National Science Academy, uh, Delhi. Uh, and uh, uh, we have, we, uh, we, you all may recall that we had uh, the International Congress of Mathematicians in India in 2010, and uh, uh, Sri Mekatramana was one of the invited speakers. Because the invited speakers are uh, uh, selected by international committees and they did, uh, not by any uh, national agency. So, uh, uh, and uh, uh, he was one of the invited speakers. In, uh, it, uh, he has also been, uh, apart from his uh, seminal research in the area of arithmetic groups, that is, which is for which he is well known, uh, he's also uh, contributed in other ways, both at uh, at uh, TF administratively at TFR, and he's also editor of uh, the various journals, the major of uh, pure and applied mathematics, he was chief editor for some years. Uh, and then uh, he's, he's also uh, the, uh, chair of the committee which uh, oversees the National Center of Mathematics, etc. So he has been, uh, played a very important role in uh, mathematics uh, of, in India as a, as a whole in various ways. Uh, as I say, as I uh, let me repeat, uh, he's well known for his work on uh, the arithmetic groups, especially the algebraic and uh, as well as uh, geometric aspects. I mean, if you Google, for instance, something like maximal subgroups, then you get a whole variety of papers, I mean, even on a specific, specific topic. And uh, so, uh, and, uh, and of course, in the conversations at conferences, etc., it's talked about. Uh, so, so uh, let me not take uh, more of your time. Uh, he's, today he's going to uh, uh, speak to us on the uh, cyclic covers of uh, the projective line and uh, arithmetic groups. O over to Venkatraman. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Dhani, for the very nice introduction. Thanks a lot. And uh, I would also would like to thank Professor Katre and uh, Devendra Tiwari for their invitation to take part in this very interesting uh, year-long program at the Bhaskaracharya Pratishthan. Uh, so what I want to talk about uh, is uh, certain families of cyclic coverings of the projective line and the monodromy group, which is associated to these families. So these are uh, certain cyclic covers, which are parameterized by uh, certain open set in C to the N and the fundamental group of the open set in C to the N acts on the homologies of these covers and that is the monodromy I'm talking about. I will come to this more precise uh, definition uh, in a few minutes. 
So let me just recall how the cyclic covering or the projective line is constructed. So giving yourself a cyclic cover of the projective line is the same thing as giving the cyclic obtaining a cyclic or the field of rational functions in one variable uh, or complex numbers because the projective line can be identified with its function field so the function field of the projective line <coughs> excuse me is just the field of rational functions in one variable uh, with complex coefficients uh, by the way today i am going only to speak about uh, varieties over c not varieties over number fields and so on. I don't know anything about them, so I won't speak about them. So if you have, want a cyclic covering of uh, this field, uh, what you do is uh, of degree D, let us say, you just also attach to the base field K, uh, the dth root of some rational function. But uh, instead of attaching dth root of a rational function, uh, you can, uh, you know, by clearing denominators if you want and replacing them by dth powers, you can assume that the rational function is just a polynomial. <clears throat> okay, so the cyclic cover of the rational function field is just uh, obtained by associating to this rational function field the dth root of a polynomial. And the polynomial looks like this. It's just a monic polynomial uh, with the roots alpha one through alpha n, let us say, and certain uh, multiplicities ki, uh, which, uh, which are associated to the roots alpha i. Each root alpha i occurs with multiplicity ki. And you can assume, because uh, the dth root can be subsumed inside k, uh, that these ki's are between 1 and d minus 1. Each of these integers is between 1 and d minus 1. And uh, one important thing which I won't return to uh, again is that these numbers k1 through kn and the number d don't have a common factor. You can assume this. If they did have a common factor, then you would be actually associating 1 by eth root which is not quite a cyclic extension of degree d, but a smaller degree. So uh, we can assume this, the numbers k1 to kn and d have no common factor. <clears throat> so the affine non-singular curve, uh, we, let's look at the first the affine non-singular curve, which consists of pairs x comma y with y to the d equals fx. This y is, so to speak, the dth root of f. That is where we have uh, we have this cyclic cover. And uh, if I let x vary through c minus alpha one through alpha n, this projective, this non-singular curve is actually a covering of this base, c minus alpha one through alpha n. So this has the structure of a compact in one surface, except that there are some punctures in it. It's a fine curve, the compact in one surface, with finite in punctures. So if I fill in these punctures, I obtain a projective curve, which is smooth, which is the normalization of this affine curve. This is a covering of P1, which is ramified at alpha 1 through alpha n, and maybe ramified also, also at infinity. So I get this cyclic cover of P1, which is ramified at these numbers, alpha 1 through alpha n, and also possibly at infinity. So the function field of uh, this cover f, this curve f alpha, is naturally identified with this field e. Excuse me, I, there's a typo. This f should be replaced by f to the one by d. So let's look at one example. I take n equals three, and uh, I look at these ramification points zero, one. And uh, uh, the other point is alpha three, which I'm allowed to vary. So I will take this tau to be neither zero nor one and uh, not infinity. 
So as tau varies, we get a family of cyclic coverings, S tau of P1, fibering over P1 minus 0, 1 and infinity. So you can consider lifts of these points, 0, 1 uh, to this cover. I'll continue to denote them 0 and 1. It's slight abuser notation. Now you, uh, let's look at this uh, differential form, dx. Uh, dx is actually a differential form on P1 itself, except that it's uh, uh, not a non-singular form. If I throw out this point 0, 1 and infinity, it is indeed non-singular. But instead of looking at the form dx, I look at the form dx upon y. This actually lives as a form in the cyclic cover, f alpha, f tau. This is tau sum. So this uh, differential form dx by y is a regular differential form. Uh, and I can integrate this. But this integral depends only on this variable tau. So how does this depend? And this is actually, if, uh, if you recall uh, what happened in the first semester, this integral is actually a Gauss hypergeometry in the variable tau. So what happens in the general case? The general case, uh, I will recall, I look at uh, this, curve y to the d equals fx. So I look at the differential form dx upon y. That's a form on the cyclic cover f alpha. And so I can look at a similar integral like this. This will no longer be Gauss hypergeometric function, but it's, it's also called a hypergeometric function of a different kind. The analog of these period integrals for more general cyclic covers a special cases of what are called Lauricella hypergeometric functions and the monodromy of this family of these curves as the alphas vary is very closely related to monodromy of these Lauricella functions. So in the Gauss hypergeometric case, the monodromy of the Gauss hypergeometric function is closely related to the monodromy of H1 of these cyclic curves. So having uh, said, having mentioned this monodromy in passing, let me recall what uh, this monodromy is all about. So uh, let me set up a notation. Uh, I hope you can see the screen. Is that okay? The screen. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The screen is visible clearly. So I start with a base, which is a variety. And I start with a morphism of varieties X to S. But at this point, I just want to think of this S and X as just manifolds. So this is a vibration of smooth manifolds. It's all fibers diffeomorphic to a fixed manifold F. So assume that the cohomology groups, uh, integral cohomology groups, are finitely generated Abelian groups. This is not much of an assumption. If I, for example, if I assume that the fibers are compact manifolds, then this is uh, well known. So let's assume these are finitely generated abelian groups. So I get rid of the torsion. So when I get rid of this torsion in the homology, I get a free abelian group of some rank, let's say. So if I am given a point here, I get a fiber over this point that fiber can be identified with this manifold F. So, but uh, this abelian group uh, is varying because they can take the cohomology of the fiber at Z, cohomodulo torsion. You have this varying family of abelian groups as S varies. So this defines what's called a local system. I don't want to be too precise about what a local system is. It just means that the clutching functions should be locally constant. <clears throat> so this defines a local system of abelian groups over S. To such a local system, you can associate a representation of the fundamental group on the base into GL of the Z to the N, GL and Z. So this is called the monodromy representation associated to this vibration. 
So all that I'm saying is I have this family of abelian groups. I take a loop in the base and move around this loop uh, in this family of abelian groups. I get back to the original family of abelian groups uh, at the base point S0. Uh, but uh, this, uh, when I do go around this loop and come back, the basis might change to a different basis. And that is what is reflected by the monodrome. <clears throat> so the image of this monodromy representation is called the monodromy group, this vibration. If the monodromy group has finite index in the Zariski closure of the integer points, so what is the Zariski closure of the integer points? I take this monodromy group, that is the image of this in GL and Z, and I look at this zero set of all polynomials which vanish on this image. So that's called the Zariski closure. So the Zariski closure of the integer points is denoted G of Z. And if the monodromy group has finite index in the Zariski closure, one says that the monodromy group is an arithmetic group. Uh, actually, the technical definition of an arithmetic group is a little different. But when you think about this, these two definitions are in fact the same. So let's stick to this. This is a simpler definition. <clears throat> so now let us specialize to the case when this manifold X and S are uh, algebraic varieties and this vibration is a morphism of algebraic varieties. But I will also assume that the fibers are smooth and projective. So in this situation, uh, Griffiths and Schmidt raised a question. Actually, this question was raised in a conference in, uh, in the Tata Institute in uh, 78, I think. It, we had this uh, international colloquia where uh, they raised the following question. Determine when in, in this general situation, when the monodromy group is an arithmetic group. In fact, quite often it's not and uh, sometimes it is and uh, when it is not uh, an arithmetic group uh, was actually <coughs> uh, the first the first examples were given by Bellin and Mostov. Uh, they gave particular examples uh, when the monodromy group is not an arithmetic group. So let me uh, say a little bit more about this. A very, this is a sort of very well known result. It says that, um, so I go back to the family of uh, cyclic coverings for the projective line. So I fix these numbers k1 through kn. I fix the number d. So I am going to vary the numbers alpha i. So I look at the family of cyclic covers, y to the d is product x minus alpha i to the k where alpha is a varying. So this monodromy <clears throat> of these cyclic curves is not always an arithmetic group. As an example, they give the following. I look at this family y to the 18 equals this, where all the numbers ki's are one. So if I look at this particular family, the monodromy of this family is not an arithmetic group. Uh, but in fact, their goal was not just uh, looking at this question of Griffiths and Schmidt. Their goal was to produce uh, non arithmetic lattices in unitary groups, UN1. And uh, uh, they showed that this monodromy group, you can actually realize it in a natural way as a non arithmetic lattice in U21. I don't want to go too much into details of this because I want to get back to the family of cyclic coverings, but this is the motivation. The result of Delin must have, uh, where they realized the monodromy group as a non-arithmetic lattice in U21 is the motivation for what follows. So incidentally, when we are talking about uh, non-arithmetic lattices in U21, 2, 1. 
So it is an open question. If non-arithmetic lattices exist even in U n one or n greater than equal to four, this is uh, not yet known. The method of Delin Master works only for U two one and one case of U three one. Uh, so, as I said, Delin and Master looked at the case y to the d equals this. But if d equals two, there is a positive answer uh, to this question of Griffith and Schmidt. Let me recall that. So let us take d equal to two. Then you have this affine equation y square equals x minus seven, x minus a two, x minus a n. This kind of curve is called a hyperelliptic curve. In this case, the monodromic group, uh, group lies in the symplectic group, sp two g z, where g is the genus of this curve. So there is a. Uh, I should have told you which year it this was. Acampo published this in 1979, I think. So the monodromic group, in this case of hyperelliptic curves, has finite index in the symplectic group, integral. Mm -hmm. Group and is therefore an arithmetic. So, in view of this Sakampo theorem, we will assume from now on that this number d is at least three. <clears throat> so, let me just um, state the main result first before going on. So the result is the following. So I take for S the set of complex intervals alpha equals alpha one through alpha n. You know to sorry. Uh, you remember I I was looking at cyclic covers y to the d equals product x minus alpha i to the k, where these alpha i's are distinct roots. You can assume that they, these alpha i's occur with certain multiplicity k i, but they are distinct. So now I look at the set S of complex intervals alpha one through alpha n. With the alpha is all distinct. So then I fix an integer d greater than equal to three, and let's fix these integers k one through k n also. So that they are, yeah, this is a somewhat strong assumption. One should not make this, but this is the uh, only case where I can prove something. So I'm going to assume this. So let's uh, look at f x equals product x minus alpha to the k i. I'm going to assume that all the k i's are co prime to k. All the k i's. So I look at this uh, set x. Of three tuples alpha, x, and y, where y to the d is f of x, where alpha is the center, and f x is the center. So the projection map from this uh, three tuple p to alpha gives a morphism from this x to s. All the fibers are smooth projective curves of fixed genus. They are all cyclic covers of the projective line. This cyclic cover is ramified at alpha one through alpha n, and maybe at infinity also. So the theorem I want to state the following: uh, It's an analog of the theorem of Acampo. If the degree of the if the number n we are looking at n tuples so the number n is greater than 2d then under these assumptions the monodromic group is an arithmetic these assumptions meaning that the k is a co prime to d okay so so i want to uh, say something about the proof uh, of this result. So, but in order to say something about this, I first want to tell you what the base looks like, what its fundamental group looks like. 
and what is the arithmetic group we are looking at it will turn out that it's a kind of a unitary group and i also want to describe the fundamental group uh, more concretely and also what the monodromy representation is so the before describing the proof i mean each one of these uh, things what is the monodromy group what is the fundamental group or the base and what is the arithmetic group we are considering all that has to be described that's what i'll do now <clears throat> so let's look at the curve f alpha uh, as before this is a smooth projective curve with an affine equation which looks like this now you see on this affine equation z mod d operates this variable y gets sent to y times uh, dth root of unity leave the axes as they are just change y to y times omega where omega is a dth root of unity uh, there is a typo i wanted omega but somehow i put in a w so the group z mod d acts on the cyclic cover well it is a cyclic cover of dp d so it should act so as this alpha varies it's clear you see what does the monodromy group do i will describe what it does but it sort of uh, moves the roots around the monodromy group moves the roots around so it doesn't affect this y part at all and so monodromy uh, action here commutes with the action of uh, this z mod d and then one more observation if i have two uh, cohomology classes beta and gamma in h1 let me recall the monodromy group was defined in terms of its action on the cohomology of the cyclic covering and the in the cyclic covering the, the relevant cohomology is h1 because the action on h0 and h2 is just trivial okay so i am going to stick to h1 only so if i have two classes beta and gamma in h1 i can look at the wedge product beta wedge gamma bar which is an uh, which is a cohomology class of degree 2 which may be identified with a complex numbers so this defines a non degenerate hermitian form and the monodromy group also preserves this hermitian form so therefore uh, whatever the monodromy group is it goes into the unitary group of this hermitian form and that is essentially the arithmetic group in which we are interested so Uh, the hermitian form on h1 is preserved by the group z mod dz as well as the monodromy group so the eigen spaces in h1 of z mod dz are left stable by the monodromy group so the restriction of this hermitian form to every one of these eigen spaces is still non degenerate that's easy to prove so the monodromy group lies in unitary group of o where uh is viewed as an algebraic group defined over the sub ring z t plus t inverse inside the integral group ring of z mod d so i take the group ring of z mod d and look at the real elements the t plus t inverse things which are invariant under the transformation t t goes to t inverse and the monodromy group lies here and the theorem that i want to prove states that the monodromy group has finite index in this arithmetic so the theorem can be stated a little more precisely if uh, the number of uh, roots alpha i is bigger than 2d and all the ki's are coprime to d then the monodromy group has finite index in the unitary group of the hermitian form and therefore an, an arithmetic group so uh, in uh, let me recall uh, in the case uh, that acampo was considering 
he had y square equals uh, this polynomial. These are all distinct. Yes. <coughs> But instead of y square, you could look at y to the d. And uh, so when all the ki's are equal to 1, uh, this is a kind of generalization of a hyper elliptic curve. Some, uh, some papers refer to them as super elliptic curves. So there is a reason for considering this. The fundamental group of the base becomes particularly nice uh, in this case. So that's why we're going to look at this first. So instead of the base uh, uh, of a complex antiples, which are all distinct alpha 1 to alpha n, we could look at the base of monic polynomials of degree n, uh, which have distinct roots. So we have increased the base a little. So I look at the base as not uh, to be the degree of degree n monic polynomials with distinct roots. So this is an open set in an affine space, uh, you know, determined by the coefficients of the polynomial. Uh, the fact that it has distinct root means that the resultant of the polynomial uh, is non-zero. And uh, that's what this thing. So I fix a base point here. In order to talk about the fundamental group, we have to fix the base point. And let us look at a, uh, a look at a loop in this base point base S naught of degree n monic polynomials. So let's look at this loop, which is based at the point f. So uh, gamma at, a, at time t will be a polynomial with distinct roots alpha 1 through alpha n. But the roots I can also think of as alpha 1 t, alpha 2 t, alpha n t, which are also moving around. Because uh, once the polynomial is moving around, its roots are also moving around. But uh, at time 0, the roots are uh, 1, 2, 3 up to n. At time 1, also the roots are 1, 2, 3 up to n, but maybe with a different order. But at an intermediate uh, time, uh, the roots look like alpha 1 t, alpha 2 t, alpha n. So the loop may be thought of as a braid then, because the each of these alpha i t moves uh, in a path starting from these numbers 1 through n and the end set the numbers 1 through n, but permuting these numbers. So since the polynomial gamma t has distinct roots, these paths don't cross each other. They are distinct roots. So given i between 1 and n minus 1, suppose I start with a constant path j, if j is not equal to i to i plus 1, I wish I had a picture. It's much simpler to show you in pictures, but sorry about that. And you have a path which starts at i and ends in i plus 1. So I have a path which starts at i and ends in i plus 1. I have another path which starts at i plus 1 and ends at i. At all the other uh, routes, the paths are constant. So that's a special kind of braid. So the fundamental group of the base is generated by the special braids S of i, which I just described just now. And you can take the SI such that the SI satisfy these conditions. If i and j are two suffices which are far apart, then SI and SJ commute. If they are contiguous, if j equals i plus 1, then a relation holds, which is called the braiding relation. Si, Si plus 1, Si, is Si plus 1, Si, Si plus 1. If you uh, recall, the uh, relations for the symmetric group also look like this, except that there is an extra relation Si square equal to 1. That I am not assuming. So this Bn uh, 
which is generated by this SIs. The SIs are given by such a path here. Yeah. Uh, this BN is generated by these SIs. It's called the braid group on N letters. Now this braid group actually acts on uh, on a free group on N letters. Uh, that is uh, sort of uh, easy to visualize geometrically. You see, uh, as I said, uh, the base S naught has the fundamental group, the braid group. And the base consists of polynomials with distinct roots. And to each such polynomial, you associate the complex numbers minus its set of roots. So that is a free group. The, the fundamental group of C minus the roots, alpha 1 through alpha n, is the free group. So you have a varying family of uh, C minus n points over this base S0. So the fundamental group of the base acts on the fundamental group of the fiber, which is the free group on n generators. So that is this action. So the braid group Bn acts on Fn as follows. So it's possible to choose these generators carefully so that the ith braid element acts trivially on the jth uh, jth generator of the free group unless the index j is I, either i or i plus i. And if the index j equals i plus i, then the si acting on xi is this is xi plus 1 essentially up to a conjugate. This conjugate is important. And si acting on xi plus 1 is xi. So let me go back a little bit. The fundamental group of the base has been identified with the group generated by these special paths. And the group generated by these special paths has uh, very nice relations. Namely, they commute if i and j are far apart. And if i and j are next to each other, then we have a braiding relation. And I have defined this action only on these generators, but uh, you can see that these generators satisfy the relation uh, that I wrote down just now. <coughs> so I can look at this quotient map. So uh, perhaps I should just explain what it is that I'm trying to do. I'm trying to give you all the uh, ingredients that go into the proof that the monodromy group is arithmetic. So in order to talk about monodromy group, I want to know what the fundamental group of the base is and what the mo monodromy representation is. So I'm going to describe a candidate for the monodromy representation. So this candidate uh, arises as follows. So first I look at this question, map, the free group Fn, I, there's a typo, F should be Fn actually. Anyway, let's call this X. The free group uh, maps onto Q to the Z, where every generator is sent to this element Q. I'm just writing this uh, group Z multiplicatively, I write it as Q to the Z. Q is a variable and every generator maps to Q. So we can equip Q to the Z with the trivial action to the braid group. And let's look at the kernel of this quotient map, F to Q to the Z. So it's stable under the action of the braid group. Uh, that's clear. So we have the exact sequence of groups compatible with the braid group action. This is the braid group action. You have an exact sequence of groups. <clears throat> uh, 
enlever. So now what I'm going to do is to look at the abelianization of this K. Now let me just first uh, observe something. Uh, the group F acts by conjugation on K because K is normal. K is the kernel to some map. But if on the abelianization also the group F acts, but K acts trivially on its own abelianization because I have made K abelian by looking at the abelianization. So while F should act on the abelianization, actually what acts is this group Q to the Z. So the braid group acts on the abelianization K ab of K, which is also a module under S. The action by F is trivial on K and therefore descends to an action of this quotient Q to the Z. And the action by Q to the Z commutes with the braid group action. So let's look at this element Ei is Xi, Xi plus one inverse. Now each Xi under the quotient map goes to Q. Xi plus one also goes to Q. So this element goes to the trivial element. So it lies in the kernel K. But this element of K, uh, you can view this as an element of the abelianization. So you can easily see that this K abelianized is a free module on this EIs under this group ring. So this group ring is just the, the ring of Laurent polynomials in the variable Q with integral coefficients. So the action of the braid group on the abelianization gives a representation of the braid group into GL n minus one of R. So this is called the reduced Burao representation. So what we're going to do is to relate this reduced Burao representation to the monodromy representation. So let me, uh, give the action of the simple generators SI that we considered on BN, uh, how it acts on the reduced Pura representation. I'll just give the fact because uh, proofs will be a little, uh, a little long. Actually, it's not uh, complicated, it's quite easy, but it's a little bit long. It's just some uh, complicated algebra. So with respect to this basis, EI, we have uh, said that the abelianization is a free uh, module over this group ring R. So the, uh, this SI acts on EI and uh, it gives a matrix therefore. So the way SI acts is, it acts trivially on EJ if J is not equal to these three numbers, I minus one, I and I plus one. And on I minus one, it acts like this, EI minus one plus EI. On EI, it acts by multiplication by minus Q. On EI plus one, it acts by this. So the matrix of TI on the span of these numbers, EI minus one, EI and EI plus one has this form. EI minus one plus EI minus Q times EI, EI plus one plus Q times EI. It looks like this, but on the rest of the basis elements, it acts by identity. So that's how the Bura representation looks. But we are not going to look at the Bura representation because there's a D, number D floating around. So that is what I want to explain. So let's look at this ring of Laurent polynomials Z, Q, Q inverse, but go modulo the D cyclotomic polynomial. So this is actually, you can identify this with the ring of integers in this D cyclotomic extension. So this quotient map 
R to R mod this, then yields a representation for the braid group into GL min minus one R, then take R and replace it by its quotient ring, R modulo this. And this quotient ring is a sub ring of this field extension E sub D. So you get the GL n minus one of E sub D. This is called the reduced bureau representation evaluated all at all the dth roots of unity. So this representation row, uh, excuse me, I have switched the numbers, row n of d, row sub n of d. It's a typo. So this is known to be an irreducible representation unless d divides n. In this case, uh, rho d of n contains a one-dimensional trivial representation and the quotient is again irreducible. So this rho d, rho n d bar uh, is the representation rho n d if d does not divide n, otherwise it is this quotient by the trivial representation. So I may, uh, it looks like a little too tedious, you know, a lot of notation, but in fact, the monodromy representation is closely associated with this rho D and bar. So, so let's look at the monodromy representation of the fundamental group of the base on the first homology of this fiber. Well, the fiber F is identified to this cyclic cover. So we have this monodromy representation acting on H1 of FQ. The latter is a module over the group ring also. So here is the theorem. The monodromy representation is actually the direct sum of these things. See, this was obtained as the reduced Bureau representation for a divisor of D. The reduced bureau representation was defined in the previous bit, this one. So the monodromy representation is actually uh, related to this bureau representation. <coughs> so the monodromy representation, uh, if I want to prove the arithmeticity of the monodromy representation, it's enough to prove the arithmeticity of the images of these bureau representations. So that is why I carried on and on about this, because from now on, we are going, only going to look at this bureau representation and what the uh, image looks like. So the main part of the proof is just looking at the image of this bureau representation and finding out uh, how to prove the arithmetic here because this will imply this, uh, thanks to this proposition. But, uh, you know, I, I have said that the monodromy representation uh, of BN is, has the property that BN preserves a Hermitian form there. So we should expect a Hermitian form to be preserved in all of these. And uh, that is what uh, we will do. The Bureau representation itself has a Hermitian form defined on it. And uh, we have to ex make explicit what that Hermitian form is. Now, uh, let me recall what the Bureau representation did. It took an element of the braid group and it produced a matrix with coefficients in a ring, namely the ring of Laura polynomials with integral coefficients in one variable. This ring admits an involution Q to Q inverse. You can view this as complex conjugation if you like. So on this uh, base space of the bureau representation, on the vector space, there's a Hermitian form which is defined like this. The basis EI and EJ are orthogonal if 
the surface is iron there far apart and if they are uh, the same the hermitian form looks like this if uh, if i look at the ith basis element and take its inner product with the i plus 1 basis element i get minus q plus 1 so if i do all this then this hermitian form is preserved by the braid group it's not difficult to see but it's unfortunately a computation so uh, the unitary group is going to be an algebraic group or a subring like this so the unitary group of the hermitian form uh, contains the image of the braid group so the braid group is contained in the unitary group of this particular hermitian form uh, with coefficients in this subring of real elements so now let's look at the reduced bureau representation like this and denote by r sub d uh, this quotient as i said this is just the ring of integers in uh, the d cyclotomic extension so this is just to be precise i i don't want to this is just a technicality so the main result uh, Oh, I'm unable to show it to you. Ah, yeah. So this is the, you know, the image of the braid group is contained in this particular arithmetic group, unitary group of the Hermitian form with coefficients in the ring of integers in this number field. so the theorem to be proved is that the image of the reduced bureau representation at the dth root of unity it has finite index in the arithmetic group here this is the arithmetic group so in particular the image of the bureau representation is an arithmetic group itself so that is how it looks like the image of the bureau representation is an integral unitary group up to finite index so the, let me just say a word about the proof and uh, i will stop here and i will indicate some parts of the proof uh, uh, next time on uh, thursday so in this range n bigger than d you can prove that the image of this uh, braid group has lots of unipotent elements so the theorem is proved by showing that the image of this braid group contains uh, substantial number of unipotent elements and uh, there was an old theorem of raghunathan and myself on uh, arithmetic group generated by lots of unipotent elements if one can use that uh, one can actually use that in this case to prove uh, that the uh, if you have a subgroup of A certain arithmetic group which is generated by lots of unipotent elements then it is itself an arithmetic group so that's the uh, that's the main part of the proof so i think i will stop here thank you uh, thank you ankatramana and uh, maybe uh, we can allow for some time for questions any questions from uh, participants <clears throat> question and concrete answer <laughs> good <laughs> um, uh, just to say if uh, n is less than d then you won't get unipotent elements and that's exactly the case where uh, you can expect non arithmetic lattices that's what delin must have done they produce non arithmetic lattices exactly in the range n less than d 
but then for them even the ki's have to be special and n also has to be bounded by 3 and bigger than 4 it won't work that uh, their scheme doesn't work at one point you mentioned that the monodromy of the lowry silla functions and the monodromy of this family are related uh -huh. but are they defined differently Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's a good question actually because the Lorichella functions were defined as periods of a certain differential form. A period of a differential form is an integral of a differential form over a homology class, mm. right? So, but the monodromy group acts on homology classes, as I just said. So it also acts on the periods. and therefore it acts on the these lorichella functions so that is how the lorichella functions are related to the monodromy of the homology okay there is a question in the chat sorry there is a question in the chat by professor bromer yeah uh, chat i uh, have to look at the chat what about when d divides n Ah, what about when d divides n? Uh, that is actually a messy case. I will come to that in the proof later, because when d divides n, uh, the uh, the Hermitian form is not degenerate anymore. It is not non-degenerate anymore. It is degenerate, and to obtain unipotent elements, that's precisely what we will use. We will use the degeneracy of this hermitian form so perhaps i should go to the oh, i uh, i seem to have um, so when d divides but i know this form uh, sorry there do not seem to be uh, more questions for the moment so and uh, no no i was answering bruma bruma's question on uh, on no, chat okay 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 i'm sorry I, uh, so when d divides n this form is degenerate but then the unitary group looks like a vector group semi direct product a reductive group and this vector part actually gives you the unipotent elements so that's the uh, that's why this d divides n is important we are going to use this fact that d divides n to obtain unipotent elements so i will come to this next time so i suppose thank you very much yeah any other questions you yeah, uh, know as we all know it's going to continue on the thursday so maybe uh, we can adjourn uh, this the talk with uh, thanks to professor vakatamana once again for the part in this cover thanks professor dani for chairing this session also thank, thank you all thank you very much then So we can log out now. Yeah, Pawan, maybe you can start the live stream. Stop the live stream.